All right, this is another video about the gut-brain connection. Today's topic is the biopsychosocial model, and my name is Dr. Scott Rauer. So today's topic is going to be part of a three-part series on understanding the gut-brain connection through three core concepts. So core concept number one today, the biopsychosocial model, is going to help be helpful to understand the bigger picture of your GI disorder which will lead us to core concept number two, the, the first core concept that is there on the bottom left, the second one's in the middle. And the second core concept is the nervous system, specifically a part of the nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. This is where your digestive system and your nervous system interact. We'll get into why the gut is often referred to as your second brain in this concept. And then finally, the third core concept is understanding the gut-brain connection through the concept of the window of tolerance. What this will do is to help you make sense of your experiences of stress, anxiety, or depression in terms of the nervous system. So core concept number one today, the biopsychosocial model. In order to get into this concept, let's start with a really old fable. It's been told and retold in many different cultures. The most famous version of this fable is about a group of six blind people. So the group of blind people visit a wise man's palace and they encounter an elephant for the first time. And each person approaches the elephant and touches it with their hands. The first blind person reaches out and touches the side of the elephant and tells the other people that, you know, an elephant is big and flat like a wall. And then the second person reaches out and instead of the side, they touch the trunk of the elephant and they disagree and they say, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> an elephant is long and round like a snake. And the third person touches the ear instead and disagrees further and they insist that elephants are flat and wide like a fan. And on and on it goes until the whole group is in a disagreement thinking that their own perception is the correct one. The wise man comes out and tells them to stop fighting and announces that an elephant is actually a big animal and that each of them has only touched one part. He tells them that they must put all the parts together to find out what an elephant is actually like. So the biopsychosocial model is similar. Chronic health conditions are like large animals with many parts. So if you focus on just one part, we're missing the bigger picture. So there's no line inside of you where your body starts and the mind ends. There's no separation. And the gut and the brain in particular have a huge overlap. One example of this is that a significant amount of neurotransmitters are created in the gut. About 90% of the serotonin in you, in you is created in your gut, and about 50% of the dopamine in you is created in your gut. So, you know, if you had a broken leg or food poisoning, you don't need to step back and look at the bigger picture. But if you have a chronic GI issue, it's highly likely that being able to step back and see the bigger picture is going to be pretty helpful. So, back in the 1970s, an American psychiatrist proposed a new concept that would later change medicine. He proposed that in order to understand the cause and progression of a disease, you need to look past the organs and the tissues and the, bio the biochemistry, the biology in general. You need to zoom out to see the bigger picture and take into account the interaction between the psychological factors, the social factors, and the biological factors. So this model came to be known as the biopsychosocial model. And it's the current model that many of the top medical centers in the world use specifically for treating chronic illness. So this means that the updated modern medical way to look at your GI issues is holistically or through a bigger lens than just the organs of your, well, just the organs alone. So this went against the norm that started all the way back in the 1600s. And back then, or it started back then, and it's called mind-body dualism. So in this perspective, there are physical things you can see, and those are real. Anything non-physical, things like thoughts and emotions, things that happen in the mind, those are less real and thereby less important. 
And so the biopsychosocial model goes against this in the opposite direction and says that the mind and the body are two parts of one complex system. In order to understand what an elephant is, you need to look at all the parts together. In order to understand what an illness is, especially chronic illness, you need to see all the parts as interconnected elements of one system. Your biology, your psychology, your social connections, they're all interconnected. Think of these like the Olympic rings. They're overlapping, they're interconnected. If you leave out one part of the system and only look at the biology or the organs of your body, you're going to miss a key part of what's making healing more complicated. You can easily just also call this the mind-body environment perspective if biopsychosocial is a little clunky feeling. So you can contrast this to the more outdated model called the biomedical model. The biomedical model only looks at the biology. It looks at the body like a highly complex machine where symptoms are due to something breaking in the machine, which calls for a doctor to act like a mechanic or a plumber to find and fix the problem. From this perspective, it's a little bit more of a limited perspective. Symptoms are either in your gut or you're in, they're in your mind. So if your doctor can't find any problems on a scan or a scope or a test, they don't know what to do with it. And the bad doctors write it off and they, they invalidate their patients telling them, you know, this must just be anxiety or this is just stress. This is not to say that the biomedical model doesn't have its place. You know, one example of a very important place that the biomedical model uh, is important is uh, researching specific diseases and treatments, you know, especially for structural GI disorders. There's lots of life-saving medicines and surgeries that have come from this perspective, but it's not the most useful perspective to take as your default view, especially as a patient. It's missing the bigger picture. So think about it this way. This view is important. The bio, biomedical view is important. You want people to take that narrow, spe specialized view the medical researchers, the surgeons, the lab technicians. You know, on a cruise boat, you want people in the engine room that have a very narrow focus on keeping just the engines running. But you want the captain to have a much wider perspective to be able to keep it all running, to keep it all on course. So when it comes to managing the bigger picture of the complexity of chronic GI conditions, the biology only focus is limited and it's out of date with current research. Many of the most advanced GI centers in the world use the biopsychosocial model where a patient has a team of professionals that take care of them, including a GI doc, a psychologist, a dietitian. And the team goes beyond just the organs, the tissues, and the biochemistry in order to work from a more holistic perspective. So here's a diagram of all the ways that the biology, the psychology, the social elements interact. Each one has a link to another, or to the others. Uh, and it's a big web of complex interactions that can either result in healing or they can result in disease. Here's another one that one study maps out. You can see here at the top, there's the genetic and environmental factors that includes the social factors. Here in the middle is the brain that includes the psychological factors. And then we have the gut physiology, the biology factors. They all interact leading towards the experience of these symptoms and then the outcome of this. It's good to note here that a lot of the research on the biopsychosocial model for GI disorders has been done in the area of functional disorders or disorders of the gut-brain interaction. And there's some evidence that this definitely does apply well to organic diseases or structural disorders, diseases like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. It's just that there's less research here because they're much harder to study. And if you're unsure what those terms mean disorder of gut-brain interaction, functional disorder, organic disease, go back to uh, the previous video to help sort that out. All right, so let's go a little further into each part. The psychology aspect of your chronic digestive issues. Uh, if we go here, as I noted in a previous video, there's a dark side to the gut-brain connection. Stress, anxiety, and depression 
are much more common in people with chronic GI issues as a natural effect of dealing with health issues, right? Kind of just makes sense. At the same time, stress, anxiety, and depression are like fuel for the fire of disease. And they're a major risk factor for the illness getting worse. And so in this way, it's a vicious cycle. The good news is that you can do something about this. You know, how vulnerable or resilient you are to stress is something that you have influence over. How much your symptoms wear you down versus how much are you able to use skills to actively cope with the pain and the difficulty of it all. One of the best steps to take in this direction is educating yourself and becoming more self-aware. So let's talk about specific practical things you can reflect on for yourself to see if your GI issues, uh, to see your GI issues from a larger perspective and maybe possibly picking out a red flag or two. So there are three psychological factors that are common when it comes to anxiety that's uh, focused on your health. I call this the toxic control triangle. So symptom anxiety, let's start there in the bottom left. Symptom anxiety. This is excessive and excessive amount of worry about any current symptoms or possible future symptoms. And this can cause someone to extensively research health information online uh, to the point that it's really counterproductive. I, I have certainly been there. I'm sure many of you have been there where you're excessively drilling into Google and it's just ramping up your worry and anxiety. This also symptom anxiety makes people more resistant to reassurance from other people and it can damage relationships. Hyper vigilance on the top here. This is when the nervous system is put into a stressed state. And when there's a stressed state, the attention becomes narrowed down and it gets overly focused on sensations in the body. When you pair this with worry, it can lead to a sensitization of the nervous system. Normally, the brain filters out a lot of the sensations that can happen in our gut. Right? When food passes through, when gas passes through, those sensations mostly, when things are going well, get filtered out. But when there's anxiety, there's often, instead of feeling of threat or danger, that gets processed. So when the mind starts to look for evidence, to confirm what it feels, this is what happens, right? It finds evidence when it looks for it. So instead of filtering it out, they become more focused on and they can trigger more fear that symptoms are about to start or if the symptoms are present, that symptoms are gonna get worse. So this unfortunately can lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then lastly, oh, actually one more note about hypervigilance. Hypervigilance is the attention becoming trapped and overly focused on what is a threat or what might become a threat. And when the attention is trapped like this, we start to discount the positives or discount things that are reassuring. Anything like signs that symptoms are improving or that maybe this, these symptoms aren't so bad right now, things that can really help de-escalate the whole symptom uh, system or the stress of things. So this last part is on the bottom right is catastrophizing. So this is a two part process that happens in our thoughts. The first part is when we're the, under the influence of catastrophic thinking, we start to overestimate or magnify the seriousness or the threat of symptoms. And the second part is that when we're under the influence of catastrophic thinking, we start to underestimate our ability to cope and we can get caught up in victim or helpless type thoughts. Unfortunately, this has a clear physical effect of amplifying the experience of pain, and it also tends to damage our relationships and the very people that might be helpful for us to regulate and cope with this stuff. So to move to the biology element of things, there are symptoms and there are the underlying factors or processes that lead to the symptoms you experience. Here, these core factors, this is some of the most common elements. It's certainly not a complete list. And these factors are pretty common in most GI disorders. So to put the underlying factors into perspective, GI symptoms are the result of some type of loss of balance in the body, or you can call it dysregulation. 
Chronic symptoms are the result of chronic dysregulation. So when symptoms don't go away or they keep coming back, it naturally causes mental dysregulation in the form of anxiety. And when the anxiety also becomes chronic, it increases the chances of falling into some type of trap that's based on either control or a trap of avoidance. The toxic control triangle is just one example. There are many traps that involve depression or using alcohol or cannabis or food as emotional crutches. Any of these traps have a negative effect on your biology or your body. And so here's a great summary of the biological effects of chronic stress. This is taken from the book, The Fiber Fueled Cookbook, which I particularly enjoy a lot. Uh, the quote is, studies have shown that stress, alter, uh, stress alters gut permeability, absorption, mucus, and stomach acid secretion, electrolyte, electrolyte and water balance, and appetite. It increases our response to inflammation. It slows stomach emptying. It activates inflammatory pathways in the gut, accelerates colonic motility, increases uh, sensitive sensitivity of the nerves in the gut negatively affects affects <laughs> blood flow to the GI tract and it activates mast cells that release histamine and finally it alters gut microbiota so huge huge effect biologically on stress and these are just the ones we know about so let's just focus on one of these one of these factors here it increases the sensitivity of the nerves in the gut this is called visceral hypersensitivity visceral just means felt in the organs of the body it's a great little cartoon here the mind talking to the gut saying it's okay sometimes i get irritable too so this happens in many gi conditions but let's just talk about ibs as an example so IBS stands for irritable bowel syndrome. The word irritable is referring to the state of the nerves in the gut. One of the effects of chronic dysregulation in the nerves in your GI tract, uh, one of the, sorry, let me say this again. One of the effects of chronic dysregulation is the nerves in your GI tract become super sensitive or irritable. You can see this in this diagram right here. In these organs, the nerves physically start to become sensitive, irritable. And in addition, normally uh, how that this happens is these nerves, sing, uh, nerves pick up the signal, then will send the pain signal up this the vagus nerve is one of the main nerves here that connects the gut to the brain. Send the signal up the vagus nerve up to the brain. And normally when the pain signal goes up from the nerve cell up the gut to the, the brain, it gets dampened down, like I was saying before, it gets filtered out. But when there's chronic dysregulation, that ability to dampen or filter out pain like this gets impaired. So the end result is that there are physical changes in your body that make it so you become hyper aware of any discomfort. So what would have been previously mild discomfort is now registered as more painful. You can see how this sh gets typically gets shifted, right? Normal sensitivity on the right, and that all can shift to the left and where the pain threshold kicks in much easier. And because all this is connected, you can imagine how any of this would fuel any of the control or avoidance traps. So. This is one part of the biology that's connected to one part of the psychology. All of this can keep us stuck in a vicious cycle. So finally, let's just touch on the social or the environmental piece. This is one important part of the picture. So we humans are a social species and our social connections or our lack of them have a big impact on both our minds and our bodies. So this part accounts for the proven impact of your current social connections and also the impact of your environment or social connections when you're growing up. 
so any trauma, either current or past trauma, as well as how much you are socially isolated or socially supported are significant factors for your health. As you can see, there's a lot of factors here. Just to keep this simple, let's just touch on two of them, one from the past and one from the present. So to go to the past first, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. These are 10 different types of uh, trauma that children experience put into three different categories. There's the category of abuse, the category of neglect, and the category of household dysfunction. Many studies have investigated the long-term impact these experiences have on children into adulthood. So unfortunately, ACEs are quite common. About 60% of adults have at least one of these, and about 16% have about or have four or more ACEs. Women and uh, or I should say, I guess females and ethnic minorities are the greatest or at the greatest risk for experiencing more uh, ACEs. In short, the more ACEs a kid experiences, the more toxic stress they're forced to process, which is linked to changes in the brain, a much greater chance of developing a mental health disorder like chronic depression or anxiety, and important for us, increased risk for developing a health problem later in life, which definitely includes uh, chronic GI problems. So it doesn't have to mean that you were hit or molested. If there was household dysfunction, if you were often scared of one or both of your caregivers, if there's lots of yelling and fighting in the home, or if there's addiction in the home, this likely had some type of emotional effect on you. And it's very common for people to minimize their own ACEs and deflect with the idea that other people had it worse. I do psychotherapy for a living. I see this often. Uh, so this is not about playing the victim. If you experienced any of these, you know, the majority of people do. The majority of people experience at least one of these. And it could be an important factor to just acknowledge and be part of the bigger picture for you. Because this is one of many factors of how the past can still be present in your body. And to be clear, there's no evidence saying that childhood trauma causes GI disorders. What does seem clear, though, is that they're connected to a web of complex interactions, like is shown in this uh, image right here. Trauma or any of these factors is just a part of the puzzle. You don't want to be missing something that potentially could be important. So to, do, to look at the other factor here, to look at the uh, present, Research tells us that, well, among a lot of things, two interesting things about ourselves. One, we humans are very bad at predicting what actually will make us happy. And number two, the quality of our relationships is one of the biggest factors, if not the biggest, for the amount of well-being and happiness in your life. So it turns out that this is also a big factor in your vulnerability to health issues. How much social support you have versus social isolation is a significant factor in the course of your disorder. Will it go into remission or will it re relapse into another flare? So there's a lot of things you could do to improve your coping. Things like learning better stress management uh, tools or doing therapy, things like that. But it turns out that accessing social support, whether it's through your family uh, support of friends, or maybe just being part of a group of other people that struggle with similar challenges. All of these have similar benefits to those other tools as well. So these types of actions significantly increase your ability to cope, especially when, you know, your health takes you down a notch. Studies on longevity in particular and well-being, they all come back with it the same type of finding, that people do best in their mental and physical health when, they, when they've when uh, they invested in their relationships. And there's a lot of different thoughts as to why this is the case, right? That's the part that we know. When you take a group of people, the 
people that have invested in the relationships, they live longer, they have less, less health issues, less uh, mental health issues, all that type of thing. And there's at least one theory of why that is the case, and one it makes a lot of sense to me, is that people are emotional regulators. If you've invested in relationships, those are very helpful uh, buffers or shock absorbers for all the stress of life. So when something gets you stressed out, um, something maybe like if you have a GI disorder, something you know like eating out or your symptoms are starting back up, this stress, it needs to be addressed. It needs to be processed in order for it to discharge. Food or alcohol or cannabis or the smartphone, these are all some of the most common emotional regulators people use. They can make you feel better quickly, but they're just a form of avoidance, a form of distracting yourself or sweeping things under the rug. The stress that was caused originally, it doesn't get processed. And so people are just left in a chronic state of emotional dysregulation. So food or cannabis or the smartphone, all these things, they're the fast food equivalent of an emotional regulator. People, connection with people, these are true emotional regulators. You know, being listened to and cared for by someone you like and trust, that actually discharges the stress and it you know, likely helps build the relationship too. So one question you could ask yourself here to assess yourself on this, uh, to see possibly how connected or isolated you might be. If you were scared or sick in the middle of the night, how many people could you call? You wanna be able to say at least two. If it's less than two, there's a good chance you're socially isolated. So in summary, chronic GI disorders can be complicated confusing and difficult to get under control. And some of the best medical centers in the world use this bigger picture perspective to help figure out the puzzle of chronic GI symptoms. In order for you to be the best advocate for yourself, you need to know where your red flags are. And because in the end, all these complex systems, they're all connected. So this sets the stage for core concept number two, which is understanding how the nervous system plays into this. The nervous system, you can think of it like the master controller of the mind, the body, and how you connect with other people. Everything runs through the nervous system. So if any of your biology, your psychological um, health, or your social elements, if any of these are chronically out of balance, it's gonna bring the nervous system out of balance. So focusing here, can take all the complexity of this and kind of simplify it down into something that's much easier to understand and to work with.